John Hook's Newsmaker starts now. Thanks for joining us for Newsmaker. We begin tonight with the Iowa caucuses. We're less than 48 hours away from first voting in the 2024 presidential race. Iowa is really a Republican affair this year. Democrats decided to completely overhaul their caucus process, going instead for all mail-in voting. And the Democratic results from Iowa actually won't be revealed until March 5th, Super Tuesday. So where are we on all this heading into the first ballots cast in the presidential primary? Stan Barnes of Copper State Communications, the, um, he's the president. I'm the He's president. the big guy. Yes. He's the man. Yes. Chuck Coughlin, president <laughs> and CEO of High Ground. Well, I have a dog that's our chief encouragement <laughs> officer. Okay, but good. Yeah, I share the title with the dog. Guys, thank you. It's great to always, <laughs> as always, to have you on the program. So, heading into Iowa, Chuck, what do you expect Monday night? It's going to be cold. <laughs> I'm going to be there. I know this. God bless you. Yes. Uh, I think it's going to be cold. I think the attendance may be a challenge uh, for less than committed voters. My, my instinct is that, uh, you know, the governor of Florida has a ground game. I think he spent a ton of money on this ground game. Maybe as few as 130, 140,000 people. Your vote matters a great deal on Monday night, especially given the weather. Uh, I He's think banked his whole it, everything. On everything is on, on Iowa, on yellow and black. Yeah. Uh, and so he... Uh, he's got to show up. I mean, and he's got to be competitive here. Um, I got to think that that's going to be a closer finish because it's so hard to poll uh, a, um, a, a state like Iowa um, with caucuses because you really don't know. It all comes down to who's Yeah, I mean, four years ago, we're there on, on going into yeah. the night, and it was a big Democrat night because Trump was obviously yeah. the nominee. Biden was to finish first or second. He finished fourth. Fourth. Nobody saw that coming. No. The, there are always surprises, Stan, out of Iowa and New Hampshire. Yeah, my rule of thumb uh, in general in politics is, is look for the energy. Where is the energy in the electorate? And in this case, the Republican side, it's in the Trump camp. And so I, who's going to brave 40 below record temperatures besides you, John, are people that are committed that believe Donald Trump was done wrong, and this is the beginning of getting it back. So his army turns out because they are so yes, passionate. Because they, they won't let the weather knock them down. If you are a DeSantis or a Nikki or anyone else, and it's that bad outside, and you're thinking, my candidate's really not going <laughs> to win anyway, I think I'll stay in and, and drink. That might be what you do. What, so. do you, what do you make of Nikki Haley's recent rise? She's actually overtaken DeSantis in some of the polling and in the real, real clear average real clear politics average. She's now number two in Iowa. Yeah, there's been a movement there. They can twist and turn this all they want, but it's because they see what we see. We're surging in the polls. The That's where she's taking her claim. I think where the demographics of New Hampshire favor her candidacy, whereas the demographics of Iowa do not favor her candidacy. What we see is more highly educated voters, uh, uh, voters with college degrees, New ha say New Hampshire, and those with fewer, say Iowa, Iowa goes Trump. A little agree, more evangelical. I mean, oh, yeah, a little bit. Social issues. Whatever that definition of evangelical yeah, okay. is today. I'm not sure it's about Christ. Well, and, but yeah, it's, it's about <laughs> that's a whole other show. <laughs> Social <laughs> issues. Yeah, but, yeah. There, but there's such a retail <laughs> politic thing that our own John McCain turned New Hampshire into his place. No doubt. And, and, and Nikki Haley wants to do some version of that. Yeah. Each of them knows that it's, it's all Trump all the time unless one of them ends up surprising. And, and Nikki's chosen New Hampshire, as you said, DeSantis has chosen Iowa. If neither of them do that in those states that are built for this, then it's hard to imagine anything but the Trump train role in this thing. Okay, if Trump reaches this mythical 50% that no one's ever reached, I think Bush, um, 41, Yeah, he got to about 41%. Yeah. That was a big number in Iowa. Yeah. Trump is probably there, if you believe the polling, but again, the polling can be really off. I do. But if he got to a 50%, does that start to just demoralize the other candidates in the field and kind of vanquish them? Yeah. I think... Yeah, I, I don't even know how they have 
positive energy right now, given all the other dynamics that are hitting them. Wherever they go, they have to talk about Trump. I wish Donald Trump was up here on this stage. He needs to be defending his record. Donald Trump should be on this stage. He owes it to you here in Iowa. And wherever they go, they try to be a version of Trump without being critical of him, without being critical right. of him and without the jackassery of Trump. Yes. So, I mean, it's none of them have found that magic handle no. of which to be Trump without being Trump, because the mob, the, the, well, they well, want the real thing. What, we've ne what we haven't seen, what we're seeing is, it, I mean, we all got to remember, Trump is a former president. He was president yeah. for years. It's like an incumbent. You're running mm -hmm. against an incumbent yes. Republican candidate. Yes. And that's the thing people keep saying. And I, you know, I'm like, well, why isn't this happening? Well, that, that's the built-in advantage of an incumbent. He is the incumbent nominee. Um, he's run this grievance campaign that it's all about people being unfair to him, which is the Republican mantra, grievance mantra, victim mantra, which is almost identical to the Democratic victim mantra. And so, you know, it's just appealing to this different constituency. Uh, he had, you remember, he had 81 million people vote for him already. And, and a lot of those people think he was done wrong. A yeah. lot of those people think the economy's gone to hell since they voted for him. And they want well, to another shot. Here's right. to tell you who, who th is primary voters. I mean, yes. high efficacy primary yes. voters, yeah. are, that is his. Yes. Yes. Okay, now, now the group that ran from Trump after January 6th, 6th, particularly the ending of his presidency, which was messy, those people seem to be starting to drift back to him. There are people coming back who were I want some. I want some of what you're Because saying. they said, well, they said <laughs> he can't win. But they're watching this going, whoa, maybe he can win. And they might, given a choice, a binary choice, Biden-Trump, they might say, I'm going back to Trump. Yeah, I mean, that's the, that's the early data that people see in, this, in these swing states. You know, we saw all these polls from Siena College and the New York Times and others saying that Trump, that Biden is, is failing the ballot test v. Trump right now. I, I think that is a reason of, of essentially voter fatigue with this ticket. I think everybody... Both sides. Yes. I think everybody... But, but Trump has a much more enthusiastic base than Biden did. And remember how Biden got into it. They all got together in South they Carolina drafted him. and said, you got to be the got, guy. Yeah, you, so, yeah. I mean, that, that, was a, that was a DNC coordinated effort because they knew he was the only They were afraid of Bernie Sanders. Sanders. Right. There is, there is no Biden base. No. There's only we don't like Trump. And so Let's you, rally around right. this. And so you still Is have, that good enough? No, I don't think so. Not the second round. Not the second time. Not with the way things have gone in the world since Joe Biden's become president plus his age, plus the, the feeling he might be corrupt because wow. of his son and everything else. I think it all combined. There's some baggage there that wasn't there in yes, 2020. Yes, exactly. Sure. We now know the Biden laptop thing. There's a, a, a lot of the electorate has lost faith in how that played out the last time. I mean, the average guy in Phoenix outside of this studio understands that the game was, was changed by powers that be in the last election. Things were held close. Were you almost going to say up. rigged? I would not. I didn't say rigged, but well, but but I know why you're bringing that up because rig rig makes it sound cheap and widespread. I'm talking about people that controlled information that didn't let it go. The average guy knows this and doesn't like it. It's not American, and so I I think this grievance thing or is. Is Chuck's way of dismissing it, but there's a lot of value well, in it. We all cut, I mean, it, there's a couple of lines of thought here we should talk about. One is the customization of people's news sources. Yes. And you can, you can believe whatever you want to hear, and you can find it. And that culture of that Republican Party today does that routinely. They listen to one thing. We know what they listen to. They listen to Donald Trump, and that is the, the mantra. And they're not changing their mind. That, that is what it is. Is there but, a persuadable but, out there? Um, amongst that base? No. no. Amongst the no, electorate absolutely. at large, there absolutely. is. Absolutely. And that's what I was saying earlier is there is fatigue. Nobody wants this contest, particularly the Democrats don't want this contest between Biden. And so until it's a reality, until Biden is a reality, um, and that's going to be the ticket, you're going to have these kind of polling. No, wait a minute. You're, you're leaving the door open that something could still happen where Biden might bow out? 
I might. I mean, who knows what happens? I no, mean, I agree with so this. We've got January a long, of twenty, we've right? Got a long January of twenty. Time. Everybody, I'd have bet my house that Trump was going to win, right? Because that was pre-COVID, and and he was rock solid. The economy was, was blowing. Was everything. What, what going about third-party candidacies, which are difficult, as you know, to get ballot access yeah. to get on a ballot in states? Yeah. RFK's in the mix. Yeah. No labels is in the mix. Yeah. How does that shake this out? It, it, they don't strike me as anything like Ross Perot in 1992. I mean, they, that, that was a, a billionaire with an ego and a drive to get on all the ballots. And these guys don't seem to have that. It seems happenstance. So I think it's it, going to be limited. It does, it does deleteriously affect Biden, though, because the Trump base is, is loyal to yeah. the end of time. They're not going to be shaken. It's everybody else, John, that is is looking for something else. There will be some de de uh, some deleterious impact on the on the Biden candidacy. I don't think it'll be enough to make a difference, quite frankly. But boy, we're but talking about close elections, right? We now. are. Yeah, we yeah. are, and and we're going to have a close election. There's yeah. no doubt in my mind we're going to have a close election. But my point that I was trying to make earlier is that once the ballot is set. People are going to go, okay, because I go back to math, and when I go back to math, my, ma my math tells me, at least Arizona math, says that the, in order to win Arizona, you have to win unaffiliated voters. You have to. It's, it's going to be 28% of the election in this cycle. Um, it's going to be 34, 32, 28. And Trump and MAGA have not won unaffiliated voters since 16. They lost him in 18. Cinema won him in 18. They lost him in 20. Biden won him in 20. Um, they lost him in 22. Kelly won him in 22. Katie Hobbs won him in 22. You don't think there's any yeah, getting back? They're not coming back. back. They're not. They're, no. And the, the facts on the ground haven't changed to make that fighting the last war. Okay, we've got two minutes. I have to ask you about the other big race in Arizona, the Senate race. Guys, Kirsten Cinema to me doesn't look like a candidate who's running. Am I wrong? I hope you're wrong. I'm, I'm hoping for a three-way uh, compelling It doesn't look experience. like, I mean, she's becoming what, what appears to be, if she's going to do it, a reluctant candidate. I don't see, I don't see the push. I don't see the making the case. We're getting a little I, late in the game, aren't we? I, I'm going to say this. She is one of the most competitive no people doubt. I've ever met no in doubt. my life. I mean, you look at the complete transformation of her candidacy of her personhood since the time we met her in the right, legislature. Exactly, right. In know, the Green Party. She's, yeah, yeah, Green yeah. Party, pink tutu, purple hair. I mean, she has completely overtaken a new body, a new person, a new intellect, a new, it's, it's something totally different. And so my one thing that I hold out there is, is she so competitive that she's not, not never say die? And we also know that she has no fondness for Reuben. And Reuben would be the, the favorite to win that race, absent her. I think, you know, you said she's late. And I think in traditional thinking, probably. But she is the incumbent. And she's not a member of either party. And she does have more money than either of the other candidates. And so I, I think she m just might have in her pocket a playbook that says, this is how I get there. Well, the, the playbook's pretty clear. She needs... 60% of unaffiliated voters. Yeah. She needs 25% of Democrat or 20% of Democrats. You think she's running? I'm with you. I, I just I'm with you. I'm not, I'm not it. convinced I, that it's actually I, I, I think she is, but it's mostly hope. But I just want to be a contrarian with you two guys. I, 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 I really <laughs> would like... Can you imagine what it would teach us about Arizona to have that incumbent it's and unaffiliated person and a liberal Reuben and a zealot carry on the right and what that would mean... Wow. Yeah. Uh, we would learn about ourselves in Arizona. Stan Twice. Barnes, Chuck, Chuck Coughlin, thank you both. We appreciate it. And I'll see Great you from uh, Stay warm. Iowa. Thank yeah. you. Stay warm, thank you. All right, when we come back, a conversation with Maricopa County recorder Stephen Richer about voting in Arizona's largest county. Coming up. Welcome back to Newsmaker. Maricopa County recorder Stephen Richer presides over one of the most important counties in a swing state in the entire country. Ellen McNamara sat down with him this week to get his thoughts about the upcoming elections in 2024. 
Stephen, thank you so much for coming in. Um, okay, so let's start off with just kind of what you do. And I wanna say that I have read, you know, some statements about you and one stood out to me and it said that you are the most important election official in the country's most important swing state. Uh, well, I think that's a testament to Maricopa County and the role it plays in elections in the country and especially in Arizona these days more than it is maybe me. But I'm the Maricopa County recorder. I'm an elected countywide position and I'm responsible for things that are related to elections, including all early voting components and voter registration components. And then I partner with the Maricopa County Board of Supervisors who oversee election day operations and the tabulation of ballots. But we work closely together on all components of the election. You were elected in 2020, um, and you really, I don't think, have stopped ever since <laughs> uh, you were elected. I mean, as far as just, you know, yes, you are running elections, but I would say unofficially, you're also kind of batting down misinformation that has just completely overtaken social media and, and some of our elections process. Yeah, so it gets to that point about why Maricopa County, why is my position so prominent? And it's because Maricopa County constitutes 62% of Arizona, which is a swing state, which could be the state on which the presidential race turns, on which the United States Senate turns. And so lots of people are asking questions about Arizona, asking questions about Maricopa County. Some people are in good faith wanting more information and we love to provide it for them and that's been a real effort of my office. And then some are unfortunately bad actors who are trying to take a situation that is very poignant and very emotional right now and is really at the partisan knife's edge and are exploiting that for wrong purposes and we push back against those people as well. It's kind of a perfect storm in Arizona just because we are a purple state, a swing state, right. but the way that we do our elections where we have so many, like 90 some percent do a mail-in ballot, uh, you can drop your mail-in ballot day of, and then two, we're just, we're close. I mean, we're a purple state, so you're gonna have close yeah. races anyway. Um, I know that you've said that you would like the legislature to come up with some way to get some of those results out a little bit faster. Um, why do you think that might yeah. not happen this legislative session? Well, I wish everyone in Arizona knows, knew what you know, because I really appreciate your acknowledgement that Yes, we're one, a male heavy state, which means that our ballots come back differently than some of the eastern states. And then two, what is really important is because we are so close, every single vote counts. And so California, we actually have a ret returns faster than California, faster than Utah, faster than Oregon. But those states, you can usually call statewide races pretty early on in the process. And so in Arizona, you have to get to where you have 95% of results in, 99% of results in. And so what I proposed to the state legislature and to the governor was, why don't we make early ballots actually early? So a lot of people like to fill out their ballot, place it in that green envelope, and then they hold on to it until election day. And that's perfectly lawful, it's perfectly fine, but that simply means that we can't pick up that ballot, signature verify that ballot, begin processing that ballot, and then ultimately tabulate that ballot until 24, 48 hours after the election. And so when you're waiting on those final results, those are the ballots that you're waiting on. And in 2022 for the November general election, we had about 300,000 people who dropped off their early ballot on election day. And you cannot process those ballots until the polls have closed. Until the polls have closed and every single voter has left, then we go pick them up and then we scan them in and then we do all those important steps that ensure the integrity of the process to make sure that it really was your account returning a ballot, you who signed it, and that you hadn't sent back a ballot previously. So you don't think probably much will come out of the legislative session um, this year? I think there might be one or two minor things that help, but right now the state legislature and the governor don't necessarily view election administration and what would be good policy the same way. So I don't see any fundamental changes in that. So we've been changing what we can change on our own, which is we've expanded our facility and we've increased the amount of temporary workers that we're going to hire simply so that we can throw more bodies on it. And then I'm also hoping that more people realize that, 
hey, if I want to have faster results, a higher percentage of results within 24 hours, then I'm going to get that early ballot back to Stephen maybe at least three days in advance because we send them out 27 days in advance. So if some voter behavior changes, then that will also help us. Yeah, um, it is it is fascinating because I think that there is that disconnect where you know we here in the newsroom, we are reporting those results and people are like stir crazy, you know, waiting on those right. results to be uh, official, but I mean, there's your kind of your hands are, are tied because you are following the law, and, and that's important because we know that in some of these close races, people will examine every part of it, and we want to be able to stand up to all the post-election litigation scrutiny as we have in the past and say, yes, we did signature verify all the ballots. Yes, we did make sure that every person only voted once. Yes, we sent it to a bipartisan team for it to be removed from the ballot affidavit envelope. So all of that is important, but I do understand the competing tensions, and so that's why I'm interested in it. That's why I proposed some solutions, and that's why we'll be doing what we can do on our own to have a higher percentage available within 24 hours. I know Governor Hobbs recently said that she might call the session, the legislators back for a special session to kind of help, but yes. I, I don't know, as we've talked about, you know, she's not necessarily on the same page as the Republican-led legislature. Well, the good thing is on this particular point, I think that Speaker Toma, Senate President Peterson, and Governor Hobbs are on the same page, and they might have a concurrent special session, meaning they'll do their normal business by day, and then they might meet in the coming weeks by night to talk about one particular issue, and that issue relates to the changed recount law in Arizona and how it sort of competes with some of the other dates, such that we might have to reconfigure a few dates such that we can send out all of our ballots for the general election in a timely manner, and that after the general election, our recounts don't get in the way of the new dates by when we have to send to Congress our presidential results so that Arizona can be part, of course, of the United States president's contest. And like I just said, Arizona is going to factor in prominently to that. Uh, you talked about recount. The recount law has changed, so we can right. expect, because we are a purple, you know, a swing state, there could be more recounts moving forward because, what, the threshold is like 0.5% now? Is right. That Exactly, you're exactly right. Okay. So it went from 0.1% to now it has been expanded to 0.5%. So if the top two candidates, the number of votes that separates them is under that 0.5%, then that means we get to recount all of the ballots. And for a countywide race in Maricopa County, that can be 2 million plus ballots. For Arizona, that's 3 million plus ballots. And so that's a lot of putting it through the machines again. That's a lot of doing hand count audits again. That's a lot of testing the equipment again. And so, you know, our attorney general General's race last year was decided by fewer than 300 votes, yep. and so I think it's safe to say that we will have a recount under this new threshold. Um, real quick before you go, the last couple of days, you know, I said you you battle misinformation, you do it all the time on Twitter X, whatever it's called now, and you went after Elon Musk. I mean, <laughs> but that is because he had tweeted something that was just absolutely false about our elections in Arizona. Why did you decide to take on Elon Musk? Well, I, just correcting what he said a little okay. bit because I'm actually a Musk fan, you know. I, I think I later tweeted out pictures of me at SpaceX, me at Boring Company, yeah. me around Tesla. But what he said was a mischaracterization of our law. And Arizona actually has the most stringent law of the entire country in terms of proof of citizenship. And so he mischaracterized that. And in Arizona, you have to show documented proof of citizenship to be able to participate in a full ballot. Now, that does conflict a little bit with federal law, and so there are some provisions that are lesser for federal law, but that's the same provisions that every other state abides by. And so Arizona is actually ahead of the pack, and he was characterizing it as somehow less stringent, and so I took issue with that. But I think he, you know, he... he he says you had lots to correct of things. it. You had to correct the record, and you did that, and, and you do it often on, on X now. So, Stephen, thank you so much for coming in. I know that we're going to be checking in with you later as we get closer to the primary and then, of course, to the election, and I'm sure you're going to be crushing Diet Cokes. Uh, <laughs> he drinks Diet Cokes like there's no I other. I drink a uh, lot that's, of Diet that's Coke. That's your caffeine. But, Stephen, thank you so much for coming. Thank in. you very much. Appreciate it. By the way, Stephen Richer is suing U.S. Senate candidate Carrie Lake for defamation over her statements about him following her loss in the 2022 governor's race. And because that case is still before the courts, Richer could not talk about those issues with us.
We're back in a minute.